There are few ships that can claim to be as unfortunate in their service as the Japanese cruiser Mogami. Here was a ship that somehow contrived to ram multiple friendly ships over the course of her career. A ship that took repeated heavy damage in her own right. And, of course, a ship with one of the most successful torpedo attacks in history against her own side. All of that being said, Mogami does have more to her story than just being unlucky, especially when you look at the convoluted design process that created her. A prime example of how some countries, Japan especially, tried to bend or outright break the naval treaty system. Let's take a look at that design process first, and then move on to her service history. To understand the origin of the Mogami class design, one needs to understand the position Japan was in at the time. At the dawn of the 1930s, the Imperial Japanese Navy was still, ostensibly, holding to treaty limits. They had tried to loophole the treaties, admittedly, with overloaded ships and the entire existence of Ryujo. Nonetheless, Japan was at least paying lip service towards not breaking the treaties. Which means that, when the London Naval Treaty capped their number of heavy cruisers at 12, the Japanese Navy was in something of a bind. In 1930, they already had 12 such ships, either in service or recently laid down. The old Furutaka and Alba classes the modern Miyoko class, and the brand new Takao class. Keeping this in mind, the Japanese still wanted more cruisers. The Japanese Navy felt their cruiser force was under strength, which isn't necessarily wrong, at least when it came to light cruisers. The most modern of these ships were the Sendai class, built in the early 1920s, which, while improved in some ways, remained very similar to the Great War era Kuma class design. As a direct result, they decided to build up to the absolute limit allowed for a light cruiser, with some secret features we'll get into later. Thus, in the 1931 Fleet Replenishment Program, the Mogami-class cruiser was born. These ships would prove to be an interesting design in more ways than one. I will go over some of the more distinct and interesting design features now. First, and most notably, they were the first ships in Japanese service to mount a triple turret. This was a break from the twin turret tradition on Japanese ships, intended to maximize the available firepower on the ships. Considering the Japanese managed to cram five of these turrets, for a grand total of 15 guns, you could say they succeeded in that goal. These turrets were mounted in a somewhat unusual layout, with three turrets on the bow and two on the stern. The first two bow turrets were both mounted on the same level, one ahead of the other, with the third turret superfiring above both of them. As for the stern turrets, they were a much more traditional design, with one superfiring over the other, right behind the cruiser's seaplane facilities. It is prudent to note, while on the topic of these turrets, that the Mogami design followed the trend set by the Takao class, in that these were dual-purpose gun mounts, allowing for the guns to elevate to 55 degrees to theoretically engage enemy aircraft. That being said, it is somewhat debatable how effective they would have been at this task. On the Takao's, the elevation mechanism proved to be fragile and inefficient. The Mogamis, meanwhile, would never use these weapons in the anti-aircraft role for reasons we'll get into later. Their main battery aside, another feature distinctive to these ships was their heavy use of welding. This was intended to lower displacement and keep the ships under the tonnage limits of the naval treaties. It was certainly unique for the time, as relatively few ships had seen substantial amounts of welding prior to these cruisers. However, it would end up proving to be something of a flaw in service. To the point that at least one source makes note of the welded plates being replaced with riveted ones in a refit. Similar weight-saving measures came in the superstructure layout, which was modified from previous designs and made heavy use of aluminum in the construction. While similar in overall design, the bridge structure was substantially smaller than on the older heavy cruisers. Smaller and squatter, which was done as much to improve stability as it was to lower the displacement. Considering how top-heavy the Takao class proved to be in service, this was likely a good idea. In any case, weight savings continued with the funnel arrangement, 
which saw extensive use of trunking to get all the exhaust coming out from one area. It's an easy way to tell the Mogamis apart from the older cruisers, in addition to their gun layout. Now, with all of this in mind, I can hear the question already. Did all this weight saving actually keep the cruisers under the treaty limit? Well, no. Not in the slightest. The Japanese would give a stated displacement of 8,500 tons on these ships, which was a bold-faced lie to the point that the British Director of Naval Construction said, flat out, that the Japanese were either building the ships out of cardboard, or lying. It was mostly the latter, although a bit of the former as well. Mogami's actual design weight, from the Japanese perspective, was 9,500 tons. Still beneath the treaty limit, but heavier than they were telling everyone else. And in the end, even that would prove to be overly optimistic. The actual displacement, in the original design of the cruiser, would be something more like 11,000 tons. Certainly not the same extent of treaty busting as, say, the Hippers, but also quite a bit heavier than the Japanese were claiming them to be. On that tonnage, the Japanese did at least manage to build a fairly capable warship. As previously mentioned, Mogami carried 15 guns, in this case of 6.1 inches, or 155 millimeters. There's some evidence these guns, which had to be designed for Mogami specifically, were chosen to go right up on the edge of the treaty limitations. Certainly Japan had no shortage of more traditional 152mm guns, so there's some merit to that argument. Regardless, these were supported by eight 5-inch 127mm guns in four twin mounts and four single 40mm guns for the anti-aircraft battery. Coupled with the theoretically dual-purpose main guns, it gave Mogami quite a heavy anti-aircraft battery for the mid-1930s. Similarly heavy, in classic Japanese style, was her torpedo armament. This consisted of 12 24-inch torpedo tubes and four triple mounts recessed into the hull on the aft end of the superstructure. Armor protection, meanwhile, clocked in at an impressively thick 100 millimeters, 3.9 inches on average, rising to 140 millimeters, 5.5 inches, over the magazines. This on top of the armor belt being inclined at 20 degrees to further increase the effective thickness. Deck armor was less impressive, though still quite decent for her time, at 35 millimeters, or 1.4 inches. As for the turrets, weight savings meant that they only had just shy of an inch of armor. Good for machine guns, Less good if you didn't want to be turned into chunks when anything bigger shot at you. But I digress. All of this could be pushed through the water at a design top speed of 37 knots on 152,000 shaft horsepower through four shafts. This high speed was roughly on par with most Japanese destroyers. When you consider the Japanese intended for cruisers and destroyers to operate together on nighttime torpedo runs, this makes a bit more sense. In any case, though, that rounds out her statistics and an abbreviated design history. So let's move on to her service history, which didn't get off to the greatest start. Laid down on October 27, 1931, Mogami would be launched on March 14, 1934. Her commissioning would follow on July 28, 1935. All normal up to this point. Only a couple months later, however, Mogami would show the misfortune that haunted her for most of her career. On September 26, 1935, Mogami was caught in the Fourth Fleet incident. This saw the namesake fleet hit by a typhoon that caused some pretty severe damage to several Japanese ships. Japan had been building their ships as light as they could in an attempt to get as much out of them as possible while staying within treaty limits. This left them especially vulnerable to weather damage and the 4th Fleet incident demonstrated this in stark detail. Destroyers lost their bows, aircraft carriers had their flight decks damaged, and cruisers developed cracks in their hulls. Mogami, in particular, saw welds pop and cracks form across her hull. This immediately saw revisions to the design, which ranged from increased structural framing to hull bulges being fitted. And again, at least one reference to welds being replaced by rivets that coming from Mark's style for what it's worth. All of these modifications serve to increase displacement by something like 1,000 to 2,000 tons, 
which cut the speed down to a bit over 34 knots. These modifications were incredibly necessary, though. Even ignoring the very real damage from the Typhoon, I've also seen reference to another ship in the class, Mikuma, popping welds when she fired her main battery or vibration issues prior to the reinforced bracing, making the fire control director unusable. Mogami was very much a victim of being too lightly built in her original design, like many other Japanese warships of the period. Following these reinforcements, Mogami would have a quiet life until she was pulled into dry dock again in early 1939. This would see the secret feature added that I mentioned earlier. You see, the Mogami-class cruisers were designed from the outset to swap their main battery. Japan needed modern light cruisers, to be sure, but what they really wanted was more heavy cruisers. Mogami's relatively large size was a very intentional design choice here. While it wasn't as simple as yank out the old turret and put a new one in, the process of upgunning these ships was a fairly quick one. It mostly needed some adjustments to the barbettes and the loading systems. Most ships aren't designed to swap guns at all. Mogami very much was. So, as a result, when Japan gave up on holding to the naval treaties in 1939, they tore out the old turrets and put twin 203mm 8-inch guns in their place. This reduced Mogami from 15 guns down to 10, but the increase in size was considered a worthy trade-off. And the old turrets, for their part, were put to use aboard the new Super Battleships, then under construction, so they weren't a complete waste of time. That aside, now a heavy cruiser, Mogami returned to service. She would spend the remainder of the interwar period close to home, for the most part. In fact, it wouldn't be until July 1941 that she really ventured far from Japanese waters. In this case, Mogami supported operations in French Indochina when the Japanese occupied the colony. She would remain in the area for a month before returning to Japan to join up with the forces assigned for the Dutch East Indies operations. Mogami missed a chance to take a swing at Prince of Wales and repulse, though, when the British ships were ultimately sunk by air attack on December 10, 1941. After that, Mogami was back on escort duty for the invasions of Borneo and Sumatra, during which she was almost torpedoed. USS Sea Raven set up an attack in heavy seas, and got off a spread of four torpedoes. This being early February 1942, and the torpedoes being Mark 14s, I think you can guess how that went. Mogami continued on her way, maybe without even realizing she had been attacked, before covering landings on Sumatra. She would remain on such duties, with the odd break for resupply, until late February. Mogami would, as a result, miss the Battle of the Java Sea. Her first taste of ship-to-ship -ship combat would, instead, be the following Battle of the Sunda Strait. On the night of February 28, 1942, Mogami and her sister Mikuma would engage the USS Houston and HMAS Perth. This battle would ultimately see the two cruisers sunk by gunfire and torpedoes, though not before several Japanese transports were sunk in turn. Arriving late to the battle, Mogami fired a spread of six torpedoes, at around 11 p.m. that night. Those six long lances proceeded to completely miss the Allied cruisers and slam into several Japanese ships on the other side of the battle. Sources do vary a bit on what exactly was hit, with Combined Fleet noting a minesweeper, three transports, and a hospital ship. Other sources will leave out the minesweeper and list the hospital ship, Horai Maru, as a transport. No matter the exact details, Mogami had managed to hit four to five ships with a six torpedo spread. Quite a success if you aren't the unfortunate Imperial Japanese Army men, a general included, thrown into the water by those torpedoes. With the end of that battle, though, it was back to covering landings and escorting convoys. Mogami would continue in these roles until the cruiser was assigned to join the Indian Ocean raid in April of 1942. As part of the southern group, Mogami would hunt for merchant shipping, with her group ultimately sinking several merchants. Then it was back to Japan for a much-needed refit, and to join up with a good chunk of the IJN for the Battle of Midway. Naturally, Mogami didn't see direct combat with American ships in that battle. Instead, she was intended, along with her sister ships, 
to bombard Midway itself, in preparation for the overly optimistic invasion plan. During this process, on June 5th, the flagship of the formation, Kumano, spotted an American submarine on the surface. This prompted an emergency maneuver to avoid any potential torpedoes, which went a bit poorly. The squadron was ordered to make a 45 degree turn to starboard, which was made properly by three out of four of the cruisers, including Mogami herself. Mikuma, on the other hand, made a 90 degree turn. Mogami's navigator was watching Suzuya, not Mikuma, and didn't see the other cruiser's mistake in time. With mistakes aboard both sisters, the result would be Mogami slamming into Mikuma's side. This caved in Mogami's bow and left her with a severe decrease in speed. Mikuma actually suffered less damage here, though she did develop an oil leak. An oil leak that would, ultimately, see the cruiser spotted by a Catalina as they limped along at 12 knots. Successive air attacks followed, from B-17s to Marine dive bombers, and ultimately dive bombers from Enterprise and Hornet on June 6, 1942. Mogami was hit first, wrecking one of her 8-inch turrets and starting fires. These could have caused serious damage, had her damage control officer not jettisoned her torpedoes. Mikuma would not prove so fortunate, as hits to her started fires that did set off her torpedoes. She would ultimately end up sinking from this damage, though her story is for another day. As for Mogami, she pushed her damage hull to 20 knots, escaping the area after picking up survivors from her sister. She set off for truck at this point, refueling from an oiler along the way. Following temporary repairs, the battered cruiser returned to Japan, arriving on September 1st. The damage was judged severe enough, especially to the turret that took the bomb hit, that a rebuild was in order. This saw Mogami's stern turrets removed, and her aft magazines modified into aviation fuel tanks and munition storage. Over the empty space on her stern, the cruiser was fitted with a flight deck. This was designed to carry 11 flow planes, and turned her into something like the newer Tone-class cruiser. Mogami's rebuild would ultimately conclude on April 30th, 1943, with the cruiser missing the battles around Guadalcanal as a result. I would like to say she returned to combat at this point, however, her ill luck would continue. Not even a month later, on May 22nd, Mogami contrived to collide with another friendly ship, this time the oiler Toa Maru in Tokyo Bay. And then, on June 8th, she was moored nearby when the battleship Mutsu suffered her catastrophic internal explosion. Mogami wasn't damaged by this, one of the few bright spots in her career, as she sent rescue boats over to hunt for survivors. As she could do little more than that, the cruiser returned to her escort duties the following day. That being said, there wouldn't be much a major note in her career for quite some time. Mogami dodged submarine attack a few times, but beyond that, nothing much. Not until November 5th, 1943, when she was hit by a Dauntless off Saratoga while docked at Rebel. It was just a single 500 pound bomb and did relatively minor damage. Fires were quickly brought under control and the cruiser sailed back to Japan for more repairs. These kept her out of the action from December 22nd until March 8th of 1944, whereupon she joined up for the Battle of the Philippine Sea and did nothing of note. Mogami wasn't really attacked by the swarms of American carrier aircraft, and as such, she avoided damage. She didn't do any damage in turn, but considering her career to this point, this is almost a victory in of itself. Back in Japan for what would turn out to be the final time, Mogami was given another refit. This saw a set of 25mm anti-aircraft guns fitted, bringing her up to a total of 60 such weapons. This sounds impressive, until you remember their Japanese 25mm guns. Still, with her morale support guns fitted, Mogami sailed off for the East Indies for training and patrol duty. She would remain in that area until, ultimately, she was assigned to the Southern Force for the Battle of Leyte Gulf. Here, the cruiser's poor luck would finally catch up to her. Mogami sailed up Surigao Strait on the night of October 24th. Over the course of that night, and into the early morning of the 25th, she was hounded by PT boats and destroyers. The ships around her, including the battleships, were crippled, but Mogami escaped damage, other than some hits from destroyer guns. 
The real damage came when she found herself under the guns of USS Portland, which hit her with four 8-inch shells. This wrecked her bridge and killed her captain and his staff. It was bad enough that her chief gunnery officer had to take command. With only one engine room and shaft functional, he turned the cruiser around and retreated at eight knots. Mogami was forced to steer by hand and the use of her remaining engine, making this task even more difficult. It shouldn't be a surprise, then, that when the retreating Mogami spotted the advancing heavy cruiser Nachi, she wasn't able to turn and avoid the other cruiser. Nachi promptly collided with Mogami. Both cruisers suffered severe damage from this, although Nachi was able to pull back and temporarily escape to Manila Bay. Mogami would not prove so fortunate. As her crew managed to, through Herculean effort, get her up to 14 knots, fires found their way to her torpedo tubes. Unlike at Midway, these had not been jettisoned. So when the fires reached those weapons, four of the torpedoes promptly exploded. With all of the damage she had taken by this point, Mogami was doomed. The cruiser would continue to limp away, avoiding yet another collision, with Ashigara this time, but she wasn't going to escape. American cruisers chasing the retreating Japanese ships showed up and opened fire. These hits set new fires and caused further damage. Somehow, some way, Mogami continued to sail on and escape again, only to then be attacked by PT boats. These were driven off, though they were a sign of things to come. In this case, as the sun rose on the crippled cruiser, American aircraft arrived. Avengers and Wildcats descended upon Mogami, hitting her with three bombs. Those bombs disabled her remaining engine and set her aviation fuel storage on fire. Now dead in the water and unable to put out the fires, Mogami was finally abandoned at 11 a.m. on the 25th of October, 1944. Her burning hulk would ultimately be scuttled by a Japanese destroyer, putting an end to a career marred with misfortune and poor luck. As for her wreck, that remained lost until it was discovered on May 8, 2019, by RV Petrol. I have already gone over her wreck in some detail, so for now, I will simply say, it shows as much damage as you would expect from her punching bag of a last battle. Thank you for watching, remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoy the content, and I'll see you in the next one.